Chapter 4, Turning an Informant, ICE, Immigration Holding Facility, San Francisco. Santini looked through the two-way mirror at the Honduran, whom the ICE detention officers brought in for interrogation. Diego was picked up a few days earlier by SFPD and interviewed by an ICE special agent who determined he was in the country illegally. He admitted to being a gang member, so the SFPD dropped the bogus jaywalking charge in one count of presenting a fake ID and turned him over to the feds. Wearing an orange jumpsuit, Diego had a cagey air about him, an alert energy. His brown eyes followed Santini into the room as he sat down across the interview table from him. Santini identified himself as a federal special agent and immediately got down to business. So, what do those mean? He said, pointing at three dots tattooed in a triangular pattern on the back of Diego's left hand. Diego held up his arm so Santini could see the design closer. They are the three possible destinations in life for a marero, Diego said. Jail, the hospital, or the cemetery. Going over Diego's complex mashup of tattoos, Santini pressed him to explain what each one signified. The ace card on his left bicep stood for the daily gamble of a gangster's life, he said. There were two large MS monograms initialed on his chest, one in block font and one in gothic, as well as sabatrusha written on his back. He had an M and an S on his left and right ears, respectively. And there were two pictures on his left arm that depicted himself, the gangbanger known in San Pedro as Sula, as Tramposo. At Santini's request, Diego stood up and unzipped his jumpsuit, revealing more skinny. The name of his hometown clique, Los Limones Locos, was permanently blazoned on the center of his chest and West Side was tattooed on his lower stomach in honor of the section of Los Angeles where MS-13 originated. Two hands clasped in prayer and grasped a rosary on his left forearm represented the pardon he sought from his mother for making her suffer and worry about his life of crime. Diego told Santini the face of another woman on his arm was a portrait of his sister, Lizette, who had been murdered by MS-13 gang members seeking revenge for Diego's failure to execute the prison grenade smuggling scheme. Lizette's name was also tattooed at numerous other places on his body, in one spot with a tombstone inscribed R.I.P. Santini could tell with near certainty that Diego had the markings of a seasoned Marrero soldier hardened in the depths of Central America's gang-infested subculture. He knew that in Diego's world, you couldn't display such a body of tattoos without spending plenty of time locked up. Here was a genuine, hardcore MS-13 Marrero who was subject to immediate deportation. He would obviously possess significant inside knowledge about the gang that could be useful to Santini's new investigation to take down the 20th Street clique. The question was, what and whom did Diego know exactly? And how could Santini persuade him to cooperate? The agent began interrogating Diego about his upbringing and how he became involved with MS-13. Diego was born in 1981, he said, in San Pedro Sula. It was the same year Honduras formally ended its 11-year conflict with El Salvador, known as the Soccer War, which was named after a huge riot in 1970 that erupted during a qualifying round for the World Cup. San Pedro Sula was a large city on the north coast of the country with a population of roughly 400,000. Diego's father was never regularly employed, but had made money as a thief and burglar. When Diego was nine years old, his family, father, mother, brother, and sister all moved from their small house built of plywood to the nearby town of La Lima. Three years later, at the age of 12, he dropped out of school and began working as a salesman at a store that specialized in refurbished home appliances. In 1996, with the country's economic conditions looking bleak for a 15-year-old with limited education, Diego made his first attempt to join the wave of Hondurans sneaking into the United States in search of better lives. When he first set out from La Lima, if Diego thought his traveling companion, his father's friend named Santo Quintana, would see him safely into America, it was a reasonable assumption. Santo had made the trip, the round trip, twice before, successfully eluding border patrols both times. The typical passage for a Central American migrant to the United States entails slipping through the Petén jungle in northern Guatemala, which covers 5 million acres and is designated a national forest. 
The terrain offers thick cover for drug and human traffickers who trudge on foot through the dense forests and swamps under the shadow of ancient Mayan ruins. Thick strands of old growth, mahogany, and tropical cedars provide habitat to jaguars and rainbow-colored scarlet macaw. Diego told Santini that his first attempt sneaking into the United States, he was one of a small percentage of Central American migrants snagged by police during the initial jungle crossing leg of the journey to Guatemala. He and Santo never made it across the Usamacinta River. They were picked up by the Guatemalan immigration officers and with no money to bribe the cops, were locked up in jail. Released three months later, the discouraged pair headed back south, home to Honduras. What did you do when you got back home, Santini asked. How did you get mixed up with MS-13? I could not get my job back at the appliance store, he said. I began to hang out on the streets more, and I met some Marreros from the San Manuel Cortez. These older males, numbering around 80 and covered in gang tattoos, were recently deported from the United States in an anti-gang operation in Los Angeles. They were well-seasoned, hardcore MS-13 members. In La Parque Central de La Lima, a rundown open air space located in the town's commercial center, in view of a cluster of small houses and a strip of ramshackle commercial buildings, Diego felt his first cruel embrace from MS 13. There, on the packed dirt, beneath the gently waving fronds of palm trees, he was surrounded by a small group of Marreros who punched and kicked him brutally for the prescribed 13 seconds. Meanwhile, a gang member shouted out, slowly counting up to 13, starting with uno, then slowly dos, tres, cuatro. Diego grimaced in pain as the barrage of kicks and punches knocked the wind from his lungs and badly bruised his head and torso until the countdown finally finished. Trece, the clique leader shouted. Bienvenidos, La Mara. Diego was accepted as a member of MS-13 and baptized with the street name Tramposo. By the summer of 1996, he told Santini the local MS clique he belonged to had grown to around 300 members. Their main rival, the 18th Street Gang, also was enjoying a rapid surge in recruitment. Claiming La Planeta District in San Pedro Sula as their territory, the 18th Street Gang was named after their section in Los Angeles where it originated. A secret civilian paramilitary group of endurance calling themselves Sombra Negra, or Black Shadow, committed itself to regularly targeting and killing obvious gang members. Basically, Santini realized Diego had been living for years with the target on his back. When Diego was 16 years old, a group of several rival gang members caught him alone on the street, he told Santini. They beat him almost to death, badly cutting him several times with machetes. If not for a good Samaritan citizen wielding a shotgun who chased off his attackers, Diego's life almost certainly would have been ended in the pool of blood on the street. As it happened, he recovered from his wounds during a month-long stay at the Mario Caterino River Hospital. What did you do when you got out of the hospital, Santini said. Did you go right back to the gang? Yes, he said. There was nothing else to do. I had no choice. You cannot escape La Mara. Released from the hospital with some serious scars from the attack to back up his credentials as a street soldier, Diego dove deeper into the life of an MS-13 thug. Armed with crude homemade guns called chimbas, single shotguns with a steel pipe and a makeshift firing pin, and stuffed with a slug and gunpowder, he and his MS-13 partners in crime robbed businesses and residents of San Pedro Sula. An older man Diego attempted to rob in the street turned out to have his own chimba, which he drew in defense. After a momentary standoff, it was Diego who fired first, shooting the man in his shoulder. Did you kill him? Santini said. No, Diego insisted. He did not die. A year later, Diego rose to become the leader of Los Limenones Locos, an MS-13 clique in San Pedro Sula. The gang was engaged in a bloody street war with 18th Street, primarily turf battles entailing sporadic skirmishes that lasted for days at a time. Diego told Santini he often fired weapons at rival gang members during hasty drive-by shootings or sneak attacks, but admitted to killing no one. He was caught by Honduran police carrying a chimba and sent to prison for a couple months without ever appearing in court. 
The next year, he was arrested again for kidnapping and attempted murder after he and a group of his homies captured and assaulted an enemy gang member. He was arrested again while riding in a carload of MS-13 members carrying guns. Only two months passed for Diego back on the streets of San Pedro Sula before he was picked up again by the police and charged with robbing a liquor store, a crime that Diego told Santini he did not commit. Without a trial, he was sent to prison called La Grinha. Without a trial, he was sent to prison. Without a trial, he was sent to a prison called La Grinha or the farm outside the country of La Sibia. There he spent the next three years locked up before ever appearing in front of a judge. While incarcerated in La Grania, Diego obtained many of his tattoos. I know I'm fucking this Spanish up, man, but oh well. You guys are just gonna have to deal with it. Upon his release from prison, he told Santini he met a woman who had become his wife, Anna. They had a baby and Diego moved in with Anna's family to put distance between himself and MS-13. Gang members began threatening Diego's parents and siblings to find out where he was lying low. They confronted his father on the street and demanded he tell them where Diego was. When the old thief refused to divulge his son's whereabouts, they shot him dead with a shotgun blast to the chest. Diego moved back in with his mother to protect the family home from a gang onslaught. One night shortly thereafter, a group of heavily armed MS-13 members disguised as police showed up. The thugs banged on the door and demanded Diego come outside. His brother opened the front door and they opened fire, killing him. A gunman stepped over the body and saw Diego's sister inside. He shot and killed her too. The assassins quickly made their escape, leaving Diego, Anna, the baby, and Diego's mother unharmed. As Diego and Anna were preparing for a hasty getaway, from Honduras to run for their lives, Santo arranged for a smuggler to get them across the Mexico-Texas border. Santo coordinated the deal with the Coyote through an MS-13 gang member named Mocho, a former soldier from the Los Limines locals, clique who had been living in Houston ever since he left Honduras in 1996. As arranged, after another long journey north, Mocho picked up Diego and Anna in Laredo, Texas and transported them to Houston where they stayed for about a month in a two-story apartment complex. It was located on a tree-lined street at the intersection of Belfort Avenue and Bob White Drive. Diego told Santini he worked for a company installing sidings on houses in Houston to earn money during their stay. Over the next several days, Santini continued interrogating Diego about his past and his knowledge of MS-13's history and lore, which was encyclopedic. He described precise details of the gang's origins, leadership, current structure, and international criminal activities. The agent grew increasingly hopeful he had a vulnerable asset on his hands to deploy against the 20th Street clique. Knowing what he had already learned, though, the agent wondered if Diego was even capable of living a normal life anymore. Youth recruited by MS-13 were drilled over and over with the hard rule that a commitment to the gang was all the way to the morgue. One of the gang's models was Vivo por mi madre, muero por mi barrio. <laughs> One of the gang's models was Vivo por mi madre, muero por mi barrio, or I live for my mother, I die for my barrio. The image of a spider web, which many Marreros had tattooed somewhere else on their bodies, symbolized the unrelenting hold of MS-13 on its members. Diego also had a spider web tattoo. To keep him talking and fill out what leverage he had on him, Santini floated a suggestion that the U.S. government might provide protection for him 